would you get to know your MCU better? Maybe take it on a long walk through the woods, share a cup of joe at the local coffee shop. But from my personal experience, let me tell you that coffee and electronics are not a good combo. But that's a story for another day. What about bare metal AVR programming? Would that help you learn more about your MCU? Yes, it certainly would. And it might be cheaper than therapy. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Jock Talk. Not only can bare metal AVR programming help you learn more about your MCU, but it can also help you write code that's more compact, efficient, and easier to maintain. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Ross Satchel from Microchip and I dig into the details of bare metal AVR programming. We take a closer look at the steps involved in this kind of programming, how bare metal compares with other embedded programming options, and how you can get started using bare metal AVR programming in your next design. Hi, Ross. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about bare metal AVR programming today. But first off, Ross, what is bare metal programming? Good question. So bare metal programming is where the instructions or the code instructions are carried out directly on the hardware registers. This means that there's no abstraction layers, and we'll come back to that in a minute, so put a pin in that. At this level of programming, the primary references are the device data sheet and the header file. And so registers are just memory locations, and we can read from them, we can write to them, and sometimes we can do both, depending on the type of register. And for this reason, bare metal programming is often known as register-level programming. Okay, so Ross, then who chooses to code their embedded system this way? So it's people who generally want to learn to use their microcontroller at a deeper level, and these people tend to go on to develop their own suite of firmware drivers, which are impervious to software updates. This means that they can write code that is more compact and also more efficient in terms of CPU cycles, and they can also write code that is more human-readable and easy to maintain by using the macros that are in the header file. That makes sense. Now, how does the bare metal fit into other embedded programming options? So that's a great question. So at one end of the spectrum, we have Arduino, which gives us greater abstraction, which means greater ease of use for new players but it hides a lot of what's going on underneath the hood from the person who's writing the code. And this is great until it's not, because if you don't understand what's going on underneath the hood, then you can run into problems when you're debugging and you can get lost pretty quickly. So then as we move further to the left, so then we have things like MCC Melody, which is a little bit closer to the hardware, but it's still abstracted away enough where the user is just calling APIs, function API calls. And then as we move further to the left, then we get to bare metal C, which is what we're talking about today. And then as we continue to move closer and closer to the hardware registers themselves, then we have things like assembler, which uh, a lot of people may have done that at university, for example. And then finally, we get to machine code or op codes, which is how I first learned to program uh, microcontrollers or embedded systems back in the 90s. And it was really hard to write the code. It was really hard to read the code. And it was a nightmare to debug because it was really easy to make a simple error that would just plague you. Cool. All right. So, Ross, can you walk me through the process? Sure. So, let's take a look at a AVR microcontroller block diagram here. And so, this is taken from the Tiny2 data sheet. And so, we start with the AVR CPU that is then connected to the bus matrix. And the bus matrix has initiators and targets. So initiators are things like the CPU, uh, DMA, bus peripherals with dedicated DMA access. And then the targets include things like SRAM, Flash, and EEPROM. Then from there, uh, we have our data bus and event routing network. And these run in parallel from the bus matrix down to all of our peripherals. And so we're going to revisit the peripherals in a moment to see how they're broken down. So let's put a pin in that. And then finally, we get all of our input output or IO data bus, which is this one highlighted on the, the right here. And then finally, we have the system management and clock generation, because without a clock generation, a system management, nothing is going to run. So Ross, you mentioned the peripheral modules breakdown. Can we get into that in a bit more detail? Sure. So through this, I'm going to be using one particular uh, peripheral or module, which is time counter B. 
So everything is going to relate to that, just so we're not jumping around to different things. So in this case, the module type would be TCB, or time encounter B. And TCB is made up of separate instances or hardware instances on your device, and they're numbered from zero up to N, where N is the number of hardware instances on your device. And so, uh, so we'd have TCB0, TCB1, TCB2, and so on. Then each of these hardware instances are then made up of registers. And these registers are broken down into data registers, status registers, and control registers. And they allow us to control everything about that particular peripheral and as well as see what's going on with it and also read the data from it. So each of these registers are then broken down into eight bits and because we're using an eight bit microcontroller. But we also have some registers that are uh, separated across uh, or they're combined across uh, multiple registers. That is, so we could have two 8-bit registers to combine one 16-bit register, or we could even have four of them to combine uh, to create a 32-bit register. That makes sense. Now, how do we know how these modules are made up, or how can we control them, Ross? So this is where the user really needs to start digging into the data sheet and also having a look at the device header file. And there's also a bunch of tech briefs uh, available on different modules and peripherals that give a bit of a walkthrough and basic use cases on how to use these as well. Okay, so how does the data sheet relate to the device header file? So that's a good question. The header file contains the type definition or type def structures or structs, and these reflect exactly the data sheet registers. So on the left here, I have a snippet from the Tiny2 data sheet, and we can see the different registers, and this is again for time encounter B or TCB. And so we have control A, control B, a reserved section, EV control, int control, in flag, status, and so on. And then if we look on the right, this is taken from the header file for the Tiny2, and these are reflected exactly as they appear in the data sheet. And if you look down towards the bottom of that uh, snippet from the header file, we have word registers. And so these are these multi-byte registers that I was talking about before, because if we look at the data sheet on the left, CNT, which is our time encounter B count, it is a 16-bit register. And we look on the right, so that's a word register. And so that just means a multi-byte register, so it's not to be confused with a single 8-bit register. So we covered the type def structs, but also the header file contains the type def enumerations or enums. And these reflect the data sheet register bit fields and bit masks. So I have the example here of clock select. And so it appears exactly again uh, in the data sheet as it does in the header file. And so notice in the enum, it's TCB because we're using time encounter B. And then it says clock select and it says enum. And then when we go into that, we can see each of the settings. So we have div1, div2, TCA0, and event. And we look at those on the header file, and we can see they're reflected exactly. And notice that they end with GC. And this stands for group configuration. So what this allows you to do is set all of the bits in a bit field rather than you manually having to go in and set or clear each bit in a bit field. So this makes your job much easier because it's very error prone to be individually setting those bits. So this allows you to do it with a simple macro. And then we go down a little bit further. And so then we have the count mode. So again, uh, on the left, we have count mode and it's showing that two colon zero. So it's broken across bit two down to bit zero. So it's three bits. And then in the header file, we have our enum, and that's TCB, because that's the module we're using, and then count mode, and then enum. And then again, we go into that, and we have int, timeout, capture, frequency, etc. And again, these are reflected exactly in the header file. So we have the TCB, which is our module. Then we have count mode, which is our bit field that we're using. And then the bit circled in the red there is the actual setting. So we have our int, our timeout, our capture, our frequency, etc. And again, they end in underscore GC, which is the group configuration that I was just talking about. So, Roz, I know I should never trust the comments, but can you show our viewers why that is? Sure. So let's take this example here. So this is, again, taken from Time Encounter B or TCB, and it's the Control A register. So let's say we want to set up the clock to divide the peripheral clock by two. So that's div two. And then we want to enable the clock as well so that it starts counting. Uh, so... I'm going to show three different ways that it's done in bare metal, and here they are. So the first one 
On the left, they are all exactly the same because we're writing to a particular register, so it's tcb A. So the first one, we have one bit shift left one, uh, and so that if we look at the data sheet, okay, the div two, the value there is one, and if we bit shift it one, that means we take it to the least significant bit in the clock select bit field, and then we bitwise all that with a one bit shift into the zeroth position, which is the enable bit. And so we generally have to write a comment there because otherwise it's really easy for someone to either misunderstand what's happening or just completely get it wrong. And the big problem here is often people go in and they'll change their code, but they forget to update their comments. And we've all been guilty of that. So then the next one, you can write it out explicitly in binary. So we have 0b, which indicates a binary sequence here. And then we have a bunch of zeros, and then the last two are ones. So again, that sets that div2, and that also enables the time account to be peripheral. And then the third one is doing the same thing, except this time it's in hex. But each time we do this, we have to trust that comment, or we have to dig through the data sheet, and we have to be very, very careful about what we're doing, because it's so easy to make a mistake when you're writing it, when you're reading it, and when you're debugging it. So this is why the human readable code in taken from the data sheet and the header file together, this makes line comments redundant. So I have the same example here. We're going to be doing ex the exact same thing. So the first one, it's a multi-bit. That's the bit field, uh, which is clock select. So we have the module, which is TCB. We have the bit field, which is clock select. We have the setting, which is div2 and then it ends in GC, so we know it's a group configuration, so we're doing a multi-bit bit field. And then we bitwise all that with the single bit one, which is our enable bit, and it's just the module, which is TCB, the setting, which is enable, and then underscore BM for bit mask. So it's really clear what we're doing on that line. So this, this means that these individual line comments are no longer required. So if you have a chunk of code, you can say this chunk of code does this particular thing. But now you don't need to add those individual line comments saying this is what this does because then when you go in and change it later and you forget to change the comments and then whoever comes after you, which is often you in six months time, comes along and assumes that you've done the correct thing and turns out that you changed something and you've completely forgotten about it. That makes sense. So Ross, how would my audience get started? So there is a series available currently on YouTube and it's Microchip's channel, Microchip Developer Help. And so there's currently seven episodes available, and there are more in the works currently. And we're going from just setting up a basic bare metal project to starting to work with different peripherals. So this series will culminate in a, a little project where we have two tiny two Curiosity Nano boards. They're both going to start in sleep mode. And then when you press the button on one of them, it will wake up, it will take an ADC, that is an analog to digital converter read of some analog signal, and then it will send that over SPI to the other one, and then it will return to sleep. The second one will be asleep, and then when it receives that SPI data, it will wake up, it will convert that SPI data into something human readable, and then it will put that out on the USART in some sort of human readable format so that we can actually see it in a terminal. So to get started with this, we can watch that series as, as it's still coming out, and we'll also download the tech brief TB3262, which is getting started with writing C code for AVR microcontrollers. And you can just go to microchip.com, and in the search bar, type in TB3262, and it will be the only hit that you get. And you can download that, start reading through it. It's very well written, very well laid out, really easy to follow. Excellent. Well, Ross, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Sure. So by doing bare metal programming in this way, it results in much more human readable code because the code is the line comment in this case. Uh, you also end up with more compact code because you can set individual bits with your bit masks. You can clear entire bit fields with group masks, and you can also set bit fields with group configurations. You can do it all in one step and it's really easy to see what's going on. Also, very importantly, it's very easy to maintain. So this means if you want to change your bit field configuration, all you have to do is change the mask name. You're not setting and clearing individual bits, which tends to be prone to errors because, I mean, we're all human, we all make mistakes. So Ross, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. 
And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Microchip. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. If you can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. <laughs>